This is your PowerPoint for your PowerPoint quiz on the Jeffersonian Republic. Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton was the illegitimate son of a Scottish immigrant to the United States. This is actually really important because at that time period, to be an illegitimate son and to be a son to immigrants would have been two strikes against you. Yet Hamilton, who grew up in poverty, worked his way into success through law and business. This becomes really significant for his point of view or worldview on how he saw himself and other people within the United States and just as human nature in general. He viewed the world as a place of nasty and brutish competition between individuals. And that really comes out of the way he, lived, he had to live and grow up in the world. Eventually, though, he climbed into success through competition and served for George Washington during the American Revolution. Afterwards, Washington appointed him to the Secretary of the Treasury. Hamilton's Vision Hamilton wanted to eventually become President of the United States. However, Hamilton's personality was difficult to work with, and nobody really liked him. So because of that, Hamilton had to establish his vision through his cabinet position as Secretary of the Treasury. Hamilton wanted the United States to be a strong industrial power in international trade. He opposed what he saw as the backwards and primitive farming republic. He looked to England, rather, as a model. England's capitalist markets, industrial markets, and its national bank was what he saw as the ultimate model for competition. He wanted to integrate all of the states into one national economy that could trade with and compete with the Europeans. The Problems for Hamilton's Vision after the Revolutionary War, number one, the national debt stood at $70 million. Number two, the states were jealous in protecting their own sovereignty, meaning they didn't want to give power over to some centralized government. Number three, the states were divided on which part of the government should pay off the debt. In fact, many of the states, like New York, were so large that they could pay off their debt individually. They saw no need to help out the other states to pay off their debt. And number four, some states believed that the government simply should not pay off the debt. Remember, after the American Revolution, the main focus of most Americans was strong state governments. Hamilton's program. Hamilton started off with the debt, and he promised that the federal government would assume that and pay off the entire debt. This is known as the assumption of the debt. He wanted to pay off this debt through tariffs. This would pay off the debt, but it would also end up protecting infant industries against foreign competition. So note what he's doing here. He's creating a strong centralized government to pay off the debt and then privileging industry over farming. He then proposed a national bank that would attract foreign and domestic investors. The bank's investments could help to pay off the debt since investors were investing indirectly in the federal government since the national bank would be under the federal government's control. The problem with the National Bank. Democratic Republicans and Thomas Jefferson hated the idea of a national bank. They saw it as the creator of virtual wealth through paper money. For Thomas Jefferson and Democratic Republicans, debt was the biggest problem for anyone, and debt would be the destroyer of the yeoman farmer. By creating paper money, this was considered to be virtual wealth, things that really had no ultimate backing to them. This would only enrich people who speculated, not the virtuous yeoman farmer. They criticized the National Bank as well for servicing industrialists over the farmers, and they argued that there was nothing in the Constitution that allowed the Congress to create a national bank. The election of 1796. The Jeffersonian or Democratic Republicans criticized the Federalists for monarchical tendencies. They also criticized the growth of Eastern bankers and mercantile interests. Remember, Thomas Jefferson strongly believed in states' rights, and he believed in the yeoman farmer. Industrialists and the National Bank for him was just a concentration of power closest to the federal government. The Republicans put up Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. Alexander Hamilton chose John Adams and Thomas Pinckney. John Adams won with Jefferson second winning the vice presidency. The XYZ Affair The French Revolutionary government wanted Jefferson to win the election of 1796. The Jeffersonian Republicans tended to be very much in favor of the French Revolution because they saw it as similar to the American Revolution in extending the ideals of the yeoman farmer. They were angry at the pro-British treaty that the Federalists had created by John Jay. Adams built up the military while sending emissaries to France. The French Foreign Minister Talleyrand demanded a bribe from American ambassadors to see him. 
The Americans were upset at this, and they refused to lead battles in the quasi-war that was taking place in the Caribbean between the French and the British. Adams did not want to go to war with France, but the public began to rally around the president against France. Remember, the vast majority of people in America at this point are farmers, so they agree with the Democratic Republicans and Jefferson to support the French Revolution. Internal Battles The Federalists passed a series of acts to create internal order during fight with France. For example, they passed the Naturalization Act, which raised the res residency requirement for citizenship from 5 to 14 years. They passed the Sedition Act, in which courts could try someone for libel or slander of a public official. And they passed the Alien Act, so that they could deport dangerous and internal threats. Jeffersonian Republicans viewed these acts as Federalists trying to intimidate them in order to maintain power during the context of the Quasi-War. The Jefferson and Jefferson and Madison then passed the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. These resolutions had a new principle called the Nullification Principle, in which states could nullify or get rid of a federal law if they believed that the federal government had overstepped its constitutional powers. This will become very important for the lead-up to the Civil War. Note what's happening here. A nullification principle, if it stands, allows states to have more power in the balance between states and the federal government. A state could decide at any time, all on its own, that the federal government had bypassed the Constitution, and therefore the state could just nullify that law and not follow what the federal government wanted. The Revolution of 1800 French conflict was eventually resolved through diplomacy and the rise of Napoleon. The Federalists lost support of the public due to the internal acts like the Alien, Sedition, and Naturalization Acts, and the fear of their support of manufacturing elites. Republicans in 1800 won the presidency with Thomas Jefferson and swept the Congress. At that point, Federalists feared that the Jeffersonians would use this moment to recreate the Articles of Confederation. However, Jefferson promised at his inauguration that the country was based upon common constitutional principles. In fact, at his inauguration, he said at one point directly, we are all Americans. None of us are Federalists or Democratic Republicans. What he meant by that was not that there weren't any Democratic Republicans or Federalists, nor did he mean that we ought not to be partisan in our beliefs, but rather that the American principles should trump any type of partisan or factional alliances. Marbury versus Madison. The Federalists and John Adams feared that the Republicans taking over two branches of government would eventually lead to a domination of the government by Democratic Republicans. They did know that the Federalists still had control over the Supreme Court and the judiciary. They had created an act back in 1789 called the Judiciary Act of 1789, which allowed for the president to create new positions for federal judges. So right before the election of 1800 had finished, John Adams began creating and sending out new court appointments until his last day in office. He was not able to send out the appointment that he had made for William Marbury. So the case came all the way to the Supreme Court, where John Marshall, a Federalist, was Chief Justice. In this case, Marbury argued that he deserved his position because John Adams had set it up before he had to leave office. James Madison argued that the position had not been filled until Thomas Jefferson came into office, and this was obviously a political position, not one being done correctly under the Constitution. John Marshall was stuck in a tough position. If he sided with Marbury, which in many ways he should have politically, it would be obvious that he was using his position for politics. If he sided with Madison, then it would be obvious that he was turning his back on the Federalists. So, he ended up making a decision in which he argued that the Judiciary Act of 1789 that allowed the president to make these positions was actually not based on the Constitution. This established the power of judicial review, in which the Supreme Court could review a law as constitutional or not. Marshall had, in essence, created a whole new power for the federal government. And what was so amazing about this decision was that it satisfied both sides. On one side, he allowed for the Democratic Republicans to win because Marbury didn't get his position. But on the other side, he gave the federal government a whole new power, fitting in with the Federalist belief that the central government should be strong. Jefferson's Actions Jefferson's vision, differing from, from Alexander Hamilton's, was a farming republic with capitalist competition. Jefferson got rid of all taxes except tariffs and sales of western lands. Jefferson's Secretary of Treasury, Albert Gallatin, cut the debt by 1817. And Jefferson promoted Western expansion, 
to promote the idea of the yeoman farmer. Jefferson's Hypocrisies However, at the same time, Jefferson did some interesting things that seemed to fit in much more with a Federalist viewpoint than with a Democratic-Republican. For example, the Barbary Pirates. Jefferson no longer wanted to pay the Barbary Pirates off the coast of North Africa. For the previous decades, there had been pirates off the North African coast that had demanded from Europeans and Americans that they pay a bribe in order to go to the North African Muslim kingdoms. Actually, these pirates had formed an agreement with these Muslim kingdoms to uh, stop ships and force them to pay this bribe. By doing that, they would then share the bribe with these Muslim kingdoms. Jefferson did not want to pay this. He felt that it went against the virtue of being a yeoman farming republic. So he sent out naval ships to end the payment. But by doing so, he was creating a military force without the approval of Congress. Another example, the Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson bought the Louisiana Territory from Napoleon for $15 million. Now, this was actually an incredibly uh, profitable venture for America, considering that $15 million really was not that much money at the time for that immense amount of land. But he did it backwards according to the Constitution. Because he had to do this so quickly, he allowed for the purchase before getting approval from the Senate. In order to have this purchase go through according to the Constitution, the Senate would have to approve it first. Now, granted, the Senate would have approved it anyway since most of them are Democratic Republicans, but the point is Jefferson was not following the Constitution literally, which doesn't fit under his belief of a strict interpretation of the Constitution. Tariffs. Jefferson was against tariffs because tariffs tended to support industry. Yet, he allowed for taxes on imported goods to remain. This hurt farmers since they had to buy from northern manufacturing and farming goods were not protected. The election of 1804. The Federalists ran Charles Pinckney for president and Rufus King for vice president. The problem was that Jefferson had successfully lowered taxes, balanced the budget, and expanded the country's growth. The Federalist's main complaint was the overexpenditures on the Louisiana Purchase. So because of this, Jefferson easily won the election. Challenges and undercurrents. Number one, social conflicts. There was a baby boom at the time that led to further expansion west. However, there was a lack of clear trade routes with the East Coast. This meant that the federal government would have to get involved in order to provide investment so that they could create these. But that meant that there would have to be some type of reinterpretation of the federal government's relationship with the states. Number two, religious conflicts. Jefferson and other deists represented the Enlightenment and rationalist thinking in the U.S. But as Western settlers started to, to, started to move out west, they created a return to the Great Awakening under the Puritans. Number three, racial conflicts. Jefferson denied the social and human nature equality of black people. Benjamin Banneker, an African American, wrote him his own scientific theories, but Jefferson just passed him off as the exception. Interestingly enough, on one occasion, Jefferson was asked about the comparison of African Americans to Native Americans. He argued that Native Americans were backwards just due to environment and a lack of education, but African Americans, he believed, were inherently unequal and could never be trained to be equal citizens within the U.S.